Uh, okay, so let me remind you what we did last time, just very quickly. Uh, there appeared a number of important concepts. Of the first one was a orthogonal tensor, uh, which is essentially one that is the transpose of which is equal to its inverse. And that uh, tensor, um, physically the proper orthogonal ones, those with a, a positive determinant, a, a positive one determinant, um, essentially represent physical rotations. And if I take a tensor, uh, any tensor that is invertible, it turns out it admits a so-called polar decomposition. We could have a left or right polar decomposition. In both cases, these are symmetric positive definite tensor, and this is the same um, orthogonal tensor. And if this is, has a positive determinant, these are proper orthogonal. Um, then we looked at uh, change of basis and rotation. So rotation is when you take a vector and you operate it on it with a orthogonal tensor, say proper, and you get a new vector, or you have a tensor and you operate on it with a rotation tensor as such, and you get a new tensor out of it. And we interpreted that as well as a rotation, as, as a rotation of the tensor as well, similar to this one. And that, that, that is a physical rotation. Okay, so, uh, and I said carefully that this represents a change in the physics, or, or that represents, let's say, a physical evolution of something. And I added the word there, uh, perceived, because the physics is, a, uh, is, is, is evaluated through how we perceive it. Okay, and I'm going to get back to that in a second. Now. Uh, another thing we can do is we can take a vector and we can write it with respect to different coordinate systems, I'm sorry, different basis sets. And then we were wondering how, for instance, for a vector, and I could do the same for a tensor, how we would relate the primed components to the unprimed components. And that is a change of uh, basis, essentially. The vector is always the same. So this is just a reinterpretation of a given physical quantity with respect to a different basis. The physical quantity itself is not uh, changing. So finally, uh, we went on to uh, in, well integral theorems. Uh, and we wanted to actually talk about that. And that's what we're going to do next uh, at the beginning this time. And uh, for that purpose, I introduced a number of operations. The first one was grad for a scalar. It is simply del phi del x. You get a vector. And if you have a vector, so I'm not going to do it for every uh, type of uh, quantity. It could be a vector. It could be a scalar. Uh, I could have a vector. I could take its divergence. And as I said, when things are clear, I will skip these brackets. When somewhat um, a messy quantity, let's say several quantities, go within the divergence, I will put a bracket to clarify which quantities divergence is operating on. So in this case, divergence v, just the black ones, would suffice because it's clear there is only one quantity. And what this would mean is, in terms of components, right? Uh, we had also intrinsic representation, but that's the component one, vi comma i. I could also have a divergence of a tensor as well, right? And we also had a curl, OK? Uh, I would suggest that you feel very comfortable immediately with gradients and divergences because they're going to appear um, all over the place. Now, one thing that I'd like to start with today quickly is that the derivative operator that is involved, right? So this one is del vi, del xi, for instance. So here, there is some derivative operator involved uh, that, in this case, we are taking the partial derivatives of phi with respect to, let's say, the the coordinates with respect to a basis ei. And that delivers the components of a vector, which turns out to be the gradient. But in the end, I'm taking the derivatives of some quantity that depends on the position as well as perhaps on time and other things uh, on one of the dependencies, in this case, on x. And we call that, we it as a special name, a gradient. But really, uh, we could have the derivative operator generalized. So this is just a short remark. So the derivative operation, let's say, may be 
generalized as um, follows. So for instance, you have a scalar um, field that depends on any vectorial field. It doesn't have to be the position uh, vector. And I can always go ahead and take the derivative, or in this case, right, partial derivative of, of phi with respect to that vector. Again, that vector doesn't have to be the position vector. And the operations still hold. So I understand the same thing from that operation. I take derivatives with respect to components and attach the corresponding basis. Okay? Um, I could have a dependence of a field on a tensorial quantity. And then I could go ahead and calculate the derivative of phi with respect to t. Okay? The idea, remember, again, it's always the same. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the partial derivatives with respect to the individual components of this quantity. In this case, it's t i j. And then I'm going to attach the corresponding basis. And for a tensor, the basis is e i bond e j. Okay? So the idea really is never changing. And what you could have is you could have, for instance, yet another one. I could have a tensorial quantity depending on another tensorial quantity. And I could go ahead and take the derivative of that as well. Right? So I want, I want to take the derivative of A with respect to B. Right? And again, you operate in terms of components. So it's del A i j, that component. And the rule is first the components on the at the top, they come first, and then derivative with respect to the individual components, KL, and then you attach the corresponding basis. And there you go, you have a fourth order tensor which is associated with some sort of uh, derivative. Okay? Um, and now, in particular, you can verify yourselves right, that if I take the partial derivative of a vector field with respect to itself, I'm going to get. Well, yeah, the components would be Kronecker delta, or the tensor itself would be identity tensor. And if I were to take the derivative of A with respect to A, then I would again get an identity, but that would not be a second order identity tensor. That would be a fourth order tensor. And as an exercise, you may wish to try and work out the detail, uh, the, the components of that tensor. Okay. I'm going to denote that tensor, I think, is not going to pop up. But fourth order tensors, I tend to put an extra vertical line somewhere uh, to indicate that it is not at least a second one. OK. So now that, that, that was sort of a, a um, remark. Now, let's go to so-called integral theorems. And this is very important and practically useful. Um, OK, so remember last time I introduced a domain in terms of notation we had some domain which we called D. And the boundary of the domain was indicated with a partial sign. Okay. Um, and the position vector anywhere, that would be x. Okay. That point could be within the domain d, or it could be on the boundary del d. Um, so now, there is a typical need that arises when we do some, when we want to state, uh, let me say, some um, expressions that, are, that have physical meanings. Okay, um, and, and within those operations, often what we would like to do is we would like to convert a volume integration to a surface integration. In other words, when possible and when needed, I'd like to be able to convert between an integral over d to an integral over del d. Okay? And that's what these theorems help us um, do. I'm going to state four particular ones that are specifically useful for us. And among these, one of them turns out to be the divergence theorem. Okay. 
Um, and, uh, but it turns out that if you actually admit the, let me say, the truth or the correctness of one, suppose you could prove one of them, the other four are implied. In fact, there are an endless set of integral theorems, if you like, and all of them fit a particular stencil. Okay? And the stencil is the following. And you will see that all of the ones that I will write, the four, they fit the stencil, of course. Um, suppose you have an integral over a domain, D, of anything. So inside here, I could have absolutely anything. And I'm taking a partial derivative with respect to xk, and that's an integral over dv. Now, when I say anything, including the index k, something with an index k could also be in there. Okay? It's also allowed. Right? So you put anything in there, and now that's a volume integral that contains a quantity partial with respect to xk. Now, it turns out that is equal to derivative over the integral over the boundary, whatever is in those parentheses, it could be arbitrarily long and complex, doesn't matter, outward unit normal to the boundary. Remember, this was the outward unit normal. Okay? And that's our stencil. Okay? Let's draw that with a blue. Now, although they fit that stencil, and I think this is sort of an easier way to remember things than any of the particular ones that I will write, it's important that we sort of are accustomed to these particular ones because they appear a lot. Okay? And um, right, so I'm going to also assume that we have Um, sufficiently continuous functions or scalar vector and tensor fields over that domain. Continuity is both with respect to differentiability because eventually derivative of those quantities will appear, okay? And notably, just the just the lowest C0 continuity. So in other words, I shouldn't have jumps in the fields. Okay? In particular, sometimes you have jumps in the fields. Physically, you would encounter such a scenario, for instance, if you have a gas and a sort of a, um, let me say, a shock is propagating through that gas on two sides of the shock let's say the pressure and some other quantities that you're interested in, perhaps temperature, they will jump from one side of the shock front to the other side. So eventually, within your theoretical or numerical framework, if you'd like to deal with such a physical scenario, then as you apply these theorems, you have to additionally take those jumps into account. And the results that I will write will not be valid as they are additional terms that have to do with the jump from one side of an interface to another side of the jump have to be added to these expressions. So these expressions, in some sense, are the minimum you would get. In our course, we will never encounter jumps in this course, and therefore, these are the ones, and in these forms, we will use. Okay? That's another remark. There is yet another remark. We are only converting from, um, from, from volume integrals to surface integrals. And the initial gradients, let me say, appear with respect to the volume integral. And then I'm converting that to a surface integral. Now, sometimes, in some instances, what you have is a, let me say, in this case, sort of a domain. And the domain, perhaps, is not fully closed. Or it might be closed, but you're interested only in some portion of it. And it's perhaps only a surface okay, that is not close. Okay? It's a surface. Okay? Inside, it's hollow. On this complex surface that almost looks like a heart, but inside, it's hollow, um, on that surface lives a field 
And that field depends on the position on the surface. You can take its gradient with respect to the position on the surface. And that's called a surface gradient versus a volume gradient. Okay? These are volume gradients. Well, if you replace V with X, at least. Um, so then one interesting application would require that you have an integral over the surface of a quantity. So now that would be a surface, uh, let's say, um, S, let's call the surface S in this case, just to indicate that's a two-dimensional intrinsically domain. And that surface has a boundary. And that boundary is this boundary, sort of the top of the cup. Okay? Um, and that is a line. Okay? Volume boundary is a surface, surface boundary is a line. And you have a gradient of a field over the surface, and you like to convert that to a lower dimensional integration over this line. There are also theorems that apply to such transitions. Uh, one case is called not the divergence, but the surface divergence theorem. Okay? And they, you could, in principle, base those transitions on the ones that we will consider. Again, this would be a special or particular continuum mechanics application. This one as well, we're not going to consider. Okay? So as usual, the philosophy in the first part of continuum mechanics in this course is concentrate on the minimum basics that I can provide, the second half application. Okay? So, but there are plenty of things that one could, of course, discuss uh, on the site. So let me get back to the issue then. Okay? Let, me, let me show you the most useful four transitions that we will um, employ. And let me try to fit all of them onto this board. So let me first write them, and then we understand how they all fit to this stencil. The first one is gradient of phi dv. The second is gradient of a vector field. Divergence of a vector field and divergence of a tensor field. And I like to convert all of these to an integral over the surface. Okay. And the transition is um, now, now when you make the transition, first of all, at some point you may want to go back and forth between initial and tensorial expressions. But you have to always, and I, I try to always give you hints about that, you have to always check whether your results make sense at all. Okay? So for instance, I have on the left-hand side a vector. What I should have on the right-hand side should also be a vector. Okay? So because what goes into this thing could be a messy expression. When you end up with the right-hand side after your, after your transition, just as, at least make sure that you still have the same tensorial order as on the left-hand side. Okay, so in this case, the transition is phi n. Okay. Um, that one, that's a tensor, so it would be V. In this case, it turns out it's V bon n. That would be that's a scalar. I have to, on the right-hand side, also have a scalar. That's a vector. I have to have a vector. Okay? Those are the transitions. The third one is... what you will recognize as the gauss ostrogradsky or simply divergence theorem. Okay. But really, intrinsically, they're all similar. Uh, now, have a look here for a moment. At first sight, this looks like a 
bunch of things to sort of learn and memorize, perhaps. But it really is not so. The only thing you really have to keep in mind is perhaps that stencil. Yeah, let me show you how it works. Now, I'm going to write in components with green on the right hand side every one of those expressions. And as I do that, I'm going to skip the basis. So feel free to always attach a date basis. So for instance, in that case, I'm going to write phi comma i. Of course, this is actually a vector, so there comes an ei. But every one of the components on the left must much match every one of the components on the right. So I'm just going to write the component equality. And so here, that's the left-hand side, phi, sorry, phi. And on the right, ni must be my choice of the index to match that one, that is the transition, okay? So let me write every one of them. So D, 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 and then del D, del D, okay? V, I, comma, J, that's a tensor. V, I, comma, J, D, V, V, I, and J. The basis would be EI bond EJ for both of them, right? VI comma I, and for that matter, any dummy index that you choose could be a K. Let me put an I. And VI and I, right? Notice that it's always scalar, scalar, tensor, tensor, vector, vector. They do match, they must match. And divergence of T, that was TIJ comma J. Um, and on the right, you have a tensor multiplying a vector, T, I, J, and J, D, A. Okay. And now, what you can do is you can go and check the stencil. Okay. Of course, the stencil is with respect to just some any index. It really doesn't matter. What matters is in every one of these cases, you encounter an appropriate choice of the index. Okay. So for instance, what goes in the parentheses in the first case is phi, right? Phi comma i. So I should have phi and i. Okay? In this case, what goes in here is vi and the index is j. So I should have vi and j. Okay? So then let me just look at this one as well. So that these are both cases where the index appears inside as well. So inside I have tij comma j. So what I should have here is tij and j. Okay? So that is how the stencil is working. Okay? So especially in complex cases, I personally prefer, my preference is I take the quantity, express in terms of the component, and then make the transition from either the right to the left or left to the right, right? It could be both sides. I might have this in my formulation. I'd like to go back to a volume, perhaps. It depends on the particular uh, uh, theoretical or numerical formulation, uh, right? So I do this and go here, right? So originally, I have a tensor. I write it in component form. I make the transition. And if there is the need that I should express this in a tensorial form, I look at this and I try to recognize its tensorial form. In this case, I recognize it as, as the components of a vector, which is a tensor times a vector. And therefore, I go ahead and write it like this. Okay? Okay. So the order would be that, that, and then coming back to this. That's my preference, of course. If you feel very comfortable with these, I personally still, you know, the basic ones I do, of course, easily recognize. But if there are many things inside, it's easy to make a mistake. I would actually recommend doing this transition, OK? So like this, okay. like that, and like that. And then coming back to this one. Okay. Or for that matter, going the opposite way. So um, now I already told you that if you admit the correctness of one of these, the others are sort of implied. Uh, so let me argue how that would happen, right? So for instance, suppose, okay, one example, uh, suppose you say this is true, okay? If this is true, if you take the trace of both sides, 
ij traces vi comma i traces vi and i. So in other words, if you have two tensorial quantities and every one of the components match, if you sum the diagonals, the sum of the diagonals will also match. Okay? So from here, I can immediately go there. Right? Um, now, similarly, uh, you can think that you, so you have a tensorial dependence. Vi is a component of the vector. Okay? So I, this could be V1, V1, and J. Okay? So V1, J, V1, and J. So let me call V1, for instance, phi. Because it matches for any I. And V1, V2, or V3, any one of them, I could call a scalar field phi. And you fall back to that one. Or if you admitted the truth of that, you would come back up here. And you could do the same thing here. You could interpret one of the i's, let's say t1j components, as the components of a vector, right? One of the, let me say, actually the rows. And that row is like the components of a vector. From here, you would fall back to that one. Okay? So actually, if you say this is the correct, this, this is correct, I don't have to prove this one. You can prove that, that, and that, for instance. All right. And for that matter, any number of identities that you like. Okay? And in fact, we will actually encounter sort of expressions where we do have to make this transition, but none of them fit precisely any of these cases, but they always fit this stencil. Questions? Yes. Uh, why do we put the bank operator between the j and k? Oh, so, so the idea is always you start from the top and go to the bottom. Okay? So for instance, you could, okay, so, right. Um, so I could have also a vector field that depends on another vector field, and I could go del a over del b. So the order is I go del A, I first the top and take its basis, and then the bottom, you attach it, the basis. So here as well, I start from the top, attach it the basis, then the lower part, attach it the basis. Yeah, but the bank operator between both J and K now, why does it appear from where it's coming? We have E, I, band, I, E, J. E, I, E, J, E, K, E, L. Well, because the thing is, when I do this operation, the order increases. So second order, second order, it becomes a fourth order. So I have to, if I, I have to do something here. And I want to construct, actually, what I understand from this is now this is a fourth order tensor. And so I should have a basis that is appropriate for that. What, what could I do, for instance? Just, right? I mean, I, I, if I leave it like this, it's not quite meaningful, because then it's look, it looks like two things operating, perhaps, on one another. So, if I put brackets, does it mean the same thing? Not really. Then you could do the same thing there. No, I mean brackets between the E I E J uh -huh. and E K E L. Brackets. But that's what I'm saying here. You does this mean in the in, so so these are definitions, right? I'm trying to be consistent with how I'm constructing my quantities. So here, if you like this, then I'm really doing the same thing there. So instead of doing that. I prefer to put a bun between the two tensorial quantities. Here as well, I'm doing really the same thing, may systematically. I, may I add something? Well, you also have an identity if you could put two brackets around ij at kl. Right? That would become a vector. If you take the dot product, dot product of j and k, and so tell me what, what you want. So the, if you put brackets around uh, ei, on EJ and you mean what what do you mean by brackets? This is a bracket. Okay, not brackets, like like uh, parentheses. Uh-huh. And bonnet with EJ. And make it act on again another parenthesis, but the K and the standard identity we have defined, right? Okay. So, that would be wrong, right? Because it's a vector. So what I understand from this is, suppose I attach components, 
What I see here is a tensor tensor multiplication. And so you remember we developed a rule for this. It's not a definition. It was based on how what we understand from this thing operating on a vector. So I would go and write ej dot ek ei bon el and so on, whatever that comes out to be. Okay. So that's still a second order one. Questions about this part? All right. So um, after about three weeks, we are finally done with the mathematical, let me say, uh, basis. But as you have probably realized and appreciated, we learned a bunch of things as well, quite a number of things. And what we now hope, at least after another homework, uh, that, that is that you will feel comfortable with many of these transitions and tools and constructs and concepts. And now, from now on, I'm just going to make use of them. So now we move into the physics. Okay. So far, it was uh, mathematically oriented. And, and, and the first topic will be kinematics.